Hey Trailblazers, welcome to your first video. If you do not have your composition book out and a piece of paper, please get both now. So I've asked you to get your composition book out. That is going to allow um, you to take notes. So you're gonna wanna split your composition book in half. The half, the front half is gonna be for things we do in class, bell ringers. The second half is gonna be for your notes. So make sure you have that ready. If you don't, go ahead and pause the video and get it. You're also going to need a sheet of paper separate from your composition book because you do have a homework assignment in this video and you're going to want to have to turn it in by this Friday. So that's August uh, 21st, I believe. Let's get started. All right, so we're going to talk about what skills do scientists use. And by now you should understand that science is a way of learning about the world around us. Doing science, all of that is really about learning. So we're exploring the natural world. Now remember that I said natural world. So that means we, we don't really explore supernatural things, even though for some of you that's really like where you want to be. You like sci-fi. You like uh, fantasy books. Science doesn't deal with that because we can't. So we have to use skills such as observing, inferring, predicting, classifying, and evaluating and making models to study the world. Now I realize I talk fast, but you guys are watching a video, so what can you do if I move through the slides too quickly? You can pause the video and go ahead and write down what you need to write down. Because as you guys are seventh graders, I don't know what experience you have with taking notes. You should never write down every single word on the slide. That would be pointless. You want to pull out what's important. What am I stressing? What's bolded? What's underlined? That's the important things. All right. Observing. You guys learned this when you were itty bitty. You know that you have five senses. You have sight, touch, hearing, taste, smell. We're gonna use those senses to gather information. Nine times out of 10, we're gonna be seeing things, okay, and recording what we see. Um, very rarely in this class or am I gonna have you taste things. Um, but what observations come down to are two different types. There's qualitative and quantitative observations. Qualitative has the word quality in it. So when we talk about qualitative observations, they're things that we can't express in numbers. For instance, if I'm doing a lab, a qualitative observation that I might want to write down is maybe the solution is white, it's bubbly. See, I'm using adjectives. Adjectives refer to qualitative observation. It smelled sweet, it smelled bad, it smelled like eggs. Those are all qualitative observations. We can't express smell in numbers. We can't say it smelled 10 to the fifth degree like rotten eggs. All of us with qualitative observations are gonna, are gonna experience them a little bit different. Maybe I say that the color of the solution is purple, but someone else sees it as a light pink. So they're very subjective. They depend on us as a person. Whereas quantitative observations, they deal with numbers or amounts. And I know that's kind of cut off on the screen, but that bottom word is amounts. So amounts, uh, the solution weighed, it had a mass of 500 grams, or the uh, distance she ran was 60 kilometers. So those are quantitative observations. We can't really argue with quantitative observations because they're numbers, they're amounts, they don't lie. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but a good, good scientific observ uh, experiment or observation, we're going to have both qualitative and quantitative observations. So again, to recap, quantitative data is quantity. That's the root word in there, quantity, amounts. So they're made with instruments like rulers, balances, graduated cylinders, beakers, thermometers. These are measurable because they are numbers. Qualitative data is a little bit different. If you look at it, it's got a brain in the middle, and then it's got the different senses surrounding it. So we're using our senses to observe what we are uh, experiencing, whether we're tasting it, smelling it, touching it, seeing it, or hearing it. Inferences, um, this is when we take our prior knowledge, so things we already know, and we apply it to what we are observing. Um, it's not guessing. Okay, guessing is really, you know, it's got its place in scientific inquiry, but inferences are based on good, good, solid information. For instance, if I look at this picture, clearly this poor young lady has spent some time out in the sun. That's an inference I can make. Why? Because I've experienced what happens when you are in the sun for long amounts of time and you don't use the proper protection. 
what's quite funny about it is I also can infer that she might have had a bowl and a spoon in her lap while she was sitting in the sun. Why can I make that inference? Well, I know what a spoon looks like. I know what shape I see on her leg. That's a logical inference that I can make. So, you know, a guess is different from an inference. A guess would be what I think she was eating. I could guess that she was eating cereal. Maybe it was in the morning and she fell asleep. I could guess that she was eating ice cream. Maybe it was after, in the afternoon and she was chilling by her pool and she had a bowl of ice cream. Those are guesses. Inference is based on stuff I already know. I already know what a spoon looks like. I already know what a bowl looks like. I know what those shapes probably will make if the sun is shining on you. That is an inference. Predicting means that I'm going to make a statement or a claim about what will happen in the future. Again, this is based on my past experience or evidence. So my prediction for that young lady might be that since she had that experience of getting that horrific sunburn, that the next time she's going to use sunscreen. Those are good predictions. Also, if I was that young lady and I had that experience with being out in the sun, I could logically predict that if I went out in the sun again without prediction or protection, that I again would get that awful sunburn. Predictions are based on my inferences. They are closely related. They're like best buds. Inferences are attempts to explain what is happening or what, or what has happened. You notice that's in the present and past tense. So inferences, present and past tense. Whereas predictions are a little bit different. They're statements or claims on what we think will happen next. All right, then in science, we always classify things. Scientists like to put things in nice, neat little boxes. So if you look at this graphic on your screen, we're looking at animals. Scientists classify animals based on the type of characteristics they share. So if you notice, reptiles are all together in their own thing. And reptiles, you know, spend uh, a lot of their life in the sun, near the water. They have similar characteristics, whereas insects are grouped separately because they generally have exoskeletons. They live a, a primary part portion of their life. They're in the pupa or larval state. And we've got fish. Fish have gills. They breathe oxygen underwater. And we have birds, which are a little bit different. They usually have some kind of light bone structure and feathers. And then we have mammals. We know we belong to that class of of animals. And so again, we classify or we sort things that are alike in some ways. All right, so evaluating. At the end of a, any scientific uh, experiment, we want to take all the information that we got, so all the data. So all the information, whether they're qualitative, quantitative, and we want to reach a conclusion about them. So if you look at the screen, you've got this graphic that says C-E-R, and you're going to hear me say that a lot. C-E-R means claim plus evidence plus reasoning, and this is where we have to be in a science class. Matter of fact, you can apply this to any class, your language arts class, your social studies class, but this is really how we evaluate information. So what we do is we have a claim. Our claim is an answer drawn from our observations. What are we saying that happens. So if you see it, it says uh, one dot claim states a direct uh, response to a question or prompt. So we're not going to say I think or I believe here in seventh grade science because I'm sorry to say in science we don't want to hear what you think. We want to see what the evidence says. So instead of saying I think or I believe, you would say things like the uh, evidence shows or the results or the data show that blah, blah, blah happened. The next part is evidence. Why do we think that claim is true? What makes us believe that what we're saying is right? So it's pro providing information that supports the claim we made. So for instance, we would again not say, I think this because I saw this. That's not really correct. You would say the data shows the the, the scientific inquiry shows that blah, 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 and there you provide your reasoning. The third and last, maybe the most important part of evaluating and using the CRE method is reasoning. Okay, you've said something happened. You use evidence from the investigation to support it. But what's your reasoning for saying that? So that's where you really back up your stuff with the evidence and make your logical conclusions. So we're going to be using this method a lot in this class. So get used to me saying the CER method.
making models. Now, this really applies to what we're doing in class this week. In class, I'm asking you to pick which type of material is going to make the best raised flower bed. So we're really not going to build one, but maybe we are. It could be awesome if we added a third raised flower bed or garden to Southwest Middle School's uh, two that exist already. But a model means we're creating a representation of something that's either too big or too small for us to observe directly. So in this case, um, we're, we're going to make models of our raised garden beds on paper. Okay, if we wanted to from there, we could further go ahead and build it. But for what we're doing in class right now, we're making a model to be able to answer a, uh, a, a problem that uh, the Department of Ag Agriculture has gotten to us. Let me give you more examples of models. For instance, cells in our body sometimes can be really small for us in class to study. So we're going to use models of cells, whether they're computer graphics, whether they're actual tangible models we can touch. We're going to use a model of it. Another type of model is models of our solar system. Maybe some of you will be lucky enough in your lifetime to explore our solar system, but for the most of us, we're going to keep our feet here on Earth. We're going to use models of the solar system to help us understand what's going on in space. So models are things that we, we make them because we can't observe them directly. All right, variables. Now, this is where things get a little bit tricky. If I were you, these, were, these would be definitions I definitely wrote down. Sometimes I find students have a hard time understanding the differences between variables. So the word variable means to change. So variables are factors in an experiment that can change. There's three types of variables we really want to focus on. The first one is the independent or manipulated variable. Independent. If you are independent, that means you function by yourself. You are not quite independent yet. You rely on your parents. Whereas most adults are independent. They take care of themselves. They, uh, they are on their own. Manipulated means changing. What are we changing? If you manipulate your parents, you're trying to change their mind. Maybe you really want to go to the movies with your friends on Friday and your mom says no. You might try to manipulate your mom by going behind your mom's back and asking your dad. To manipulate means to change. So when we have a scientific investigation... The factor that we're changing is the independent or manipulated variable. For instance, if I wanted to see what type of fertilizer grows, is going to have tomato plants grow the best, my independent variable would be the type of fertilizer. That's what I'm going to change. Maybe I use miracle Grow, Maybe I use Walmart brand. Maybe I use Home Depot brand. I'm changing the type of fertilizer to see which one makes my tomato plants grow taller. Now, the dependent or responding variable is the one that changes because of what we change. Now, I know that's kind of tricky to understand, but let me relate it back to our tomato plants. If we have our tomato plants and we're changing the type of fertilizer, our dependent variable is going to be the height of the plant because that what de that's what depends on what type of fertilizer we use. So that's what we're measuring. Our dependent variable is what is being measured. The controlling variable or controlled variable is what is kept the same. So if I go back to the tomato plant example, I would use the same type height of tomato plant. I would use the same type of um, uh, planting planter, the, the, the container we put the uh, plant in. I would be changing the fertilizer, but I would use the same soil. I would give each plant the same amount of water every day. They would get the same amount of sunlight every day. Those are controlling variables. Those are what are kept the same. So uh, there's lots and lots of help on variables and we're going to study them more in class because I think you guys probably need the help. All right, your turn. This is where you're going to get your piece of paper. This is where you're going to turn things into me. This is the paper you're going to turn into me on Friday. It is due Friday, so you have Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night to get this all done. So there are 10 things, so you might want to leave yourself room. The first three, I want to know if you think the examples are qualitative or quantitative data. So you might want to go ahead and pause the video and give yourself time to put your name on the top, whatever mod you're in, and then um, the date, and then go ahead and put for one, two, or three, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. You can't be lazy and put Q. They both start with Q. You need to write the words out. So go ahead and take a minute. Pause this if you need to. 
All right, the next three examples, so four, five, and six, have to do with whether or not we're making an inference or predicting. Let me give you another hint. Inferences have to do on have to do with what has happened or what is happening, and predictions have to do what with what we think will happen. Now, remember, they're all based on logical conclusions. So again, if you need to go ahead and pause this so that you can write your answers down, please do. All right, so the next time, the next two we're going to do, 9 and 10, have to do with scenarios. We're going to pick out the independent variable and any the dependent variable and any controlling variables we found. Remember, independent is what we're changing in the experiment. So if we look at the example on the right, uh, our question is, what colors get hot in the sunlight the fastest? So what are we changing? We're changing the different colors of paper. Now, if we look at the dependent variable, what depend? that's what depends on the changes we made in the experiment. We're changing the different colors of the paper, so we want to measure the temperatures of each colored piece of paper. That's the dependent variable. The control in this case would be that each piece of paper got equal amounts of sunlight. All right, you ready? Set, go. And I know this says nine. I think I, I can't uh, count right now. This is, I think, number, uh, maybe number seven. So we did three uh, qualitative, quantitative, three um, uh, inferences and predictions, so this should be number seven, I'm sorry. There's actually going to be eight things on your homework. All right, Yasmin wanted to see if different types of trash attracted different types of insects. For one week, Yasmin put only fruit and vegetable peelings in a corner of her backyard. She put 50 grams of material out a day and checked it six times a day for 10 minutes each. During that 10 minutes, she counted and recorded that type and amount of insects that visited her trash. The next week, Yasmin only used dairy and meat trash. She kept the amount of trash and times she checked the same. So the independent variable you want to record on here, what is it that Yasmin's changing? For the dependent variable, you want to record what is it that she's measuring. And then for the controlling variables, there's several. You can put all of them if you like, but you just have to give me one. So I want the independent, dependent, and at least one controlled variable in this experiment. The next one should be number eight, and this is your last one. It says, Theo likes to bake cookies. He wants to see which type of Southwest Middle School students, which type of cookie they like the best. He bakes four different types of cookies, peanut butter, chocolate chip, oatmeal raisin, and snickerdoodle. He asked 40 students, 20 boys, 20 girls, to try each cookie and rate it based on their preference from one to four, with four being their absolute favorite and one being their absolute least favorite. So again, what is Theo changing? That would be Theo's independent variable. What depends on that is going to be the dependent variable. So what is it that he's measuring from the students? And lastly, there are um, there's a couple um, controlling variables. You just have to p uh, pick at least one. Well, if you need to go back and rewind and re see any part of this video, please do. Uh, I'm posting this today, August 18th. It is due to me this Friday. So if you have any questions, please see me in class. Good luck.